So, first, a welcome to uh, our listeners. Uh, this is our first episode of myself and Rufus Pollock uh, from Life Itself and Stephen Deal in exploring the Web3 and crypto uh, ecosystem and particularly its narratives and doing a real deep dive and analysis and a deconstruction of those uh, and, and really also the aspirations behind them. What is the hopes, aspirations, fears that are driving the crypto and Web3 uh, space? Uh, because I think they go beyond, we think they go beyond just they, they talk to broader concerns that exist in our society today. So I think this is a fascinating opportunity for collective sense-making. Um, and Steve and I are going to dive into this. Stephen, do you want to get to say anything just to start out, uh, just to introduce yourself or anything like that? Yeah, thanks Rufus for having me today. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be a productive conversation about uh, exploring kind of one of the crypto narratives in a deep dive and trying to shed some light on uh, what are the aspirations of these ideas and whether they have any legs to stand on. Great. And so just to start, I would just say this is going to be the first of the several episodes. We're really going to try and look in depth at crypto and Web3. And we're going to steel man the various positions that, as we understand them and evaluate them, try and see what, what there is in them, what, what the best version of them is, and what if there is real, uh, real uh, kind of gold, as it were, in those uh, narratives or, or arguments. And then we're going to evaluate them. We're going to try and understand what, what, whether they do hold water or not. And today we're going to start with the kind of the the the, the grandfather, the, the the big daddy, which is Bitcoin, and the neo medalist uh, position, the neo medalist thesis around uh, Bitcoin and the background. So I wondered, Stephen, you know, you maybe want to start us off here and tell me a little, maybe we're going to try and summarize what that position uh, is on the neo metalist. So maybe, yeah, just if you want to kick us off and just outline that a little bit. Sure. So uh, metalism uh, is the belief that um, monetary supply, like a nation's currency, uh, should be backed by well, precious metals. Um, so historically throughout history, um, nations have used uh, either metals directly or used sort of instruments based on uh, metals, typically gold or silver, uh, as a kind of fundamental like backing for their currency. So if you had a note, you would be able to go to the treasury and redeem it for a fixed amount of metal. Um, so obviously this is not the system that we live under today. Uh, it's a historical idea. Uh, but it's one that has a kind of resurgence as of late, and it harkens back to some very um, ideas in history about what is the proper and right way to um, run a country's money supply and what's the optimal way to distribute uh, and value currency. And so the narrative around Bitcoin, um, the one that's particularly popular amongst its advocates is that uh, Bitcoin is like a new form of a digital gold. Uh, that its properties and similarities to the economic properties of gold make it suitable to be the basis for um, a new like metal standard, like a new gold standard. Um, and this is an idea that has certain reverberations in certain heterodox schools of economics, um, not contemporary schools of economics, but ones that were kind of historically popular back in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and so I think we're going to kind of critically analyze some of those schools of thought, both on the kind of notion of like, what is the gold standard? Um, was it a good idea? What were the core ideas behind it? Why did it give rise to economies in the past? And why did we move away from it? Uh, and then talk about the similarities between, you know, does Bitcoin in fact behave like gold? And see if those kind of arguments have any legs. Great. Yeah, very clear. And so maybe we can start with you, gold. Let's talk a little bit about gold. Gold is this historical precedent as money across cultures going back millennia, and multiple cultures have used it as the currency. Do you want to talk a little bit more about? So that's like the the first aspect is just like gold, gold as a currency, the maybe the original currency in certain sense, or certainly broad, broadly accepted currency. Yeah, throughout like human history, all the way back to like the Fertile Crescent, 
uh, people were using gold as like a medium of exchange. They would buy things like you know wheat and livestock. Um, we certainly in Europe used gold for centuries uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, the Chinese also independently kind of used it as a medium of exchange, and even the Americas, like the Incas, were uh, using gold. Um, so it has this kind of universality to it across the entire human existence. Um, that seems to be kind of independently derived by multiple cultures, independent of each other. Um, and that's for a good reason. Gold is a very unique element. So there's only 118 elements on the periodic table, right? Um, and gold has some very interesting properties as a metal. Um, so it's you know stable at room temperature. Um, there's an abundance of it on earth, but there's not too much of an abundance of it. So like there's enough that it's kind of scarce, but not too scarce. Uh, so people can find it, you know, in like streams and rivers, you can mine for it if you dig for it a little bit. Um, it has a kind of a luster and a shimmer to it that kind of is easily recognizable. Um, it's malleable, you can bite it with your teeth, it's tested, it's cold, right? Um, and it's not that, um, you can't easily confuse it with other metals, right? Uh, and the fact that it can be melted at temperatures that are, um, you know, easily accessible for even like Bronze Age cultures means that it can be kind of molded into coinage and uh, redistributed into bars. And, you know, this is, doesn't require a lot of advanced technology. So that's why, like, it's almost singularly the element that kind of nature has kind of given us uh, that kind of works as a primitive form of money uh, because it can be used for the three functions of money, which is a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and a store of value. And the store of value is something that's kind of been historically true throughout history. Uh, and that's why gold is historically been used and uh, all the way back up to like the 1930s. Uh, and some countries, some countries still stockpile it as a, as a store. So, and to, just to say a little bit more about that, because gold. people who are theorists of money, like this will be familiar, but just to emphasize, you said three points there, of like for a money, mm -hmm. there are three kind of criteria or three desiderata it might not fulfill always you know gold evolved in various ways but just to recap those which we just said which is a unit of account um a medium of exchange and a store of value wow. so just to say what do we mean by unit of just to just can you just explain briefly what each of those three mean and illustrate yeah. them maybe with gold so a unit of account means it's like divisible into a small set of units that we can count, right? Uh, so we can basically denominate um, the price of something in a fixed amount of gold, whether it be nuggets or coins, like there's a, you know, there's a unit that we can specify just like we would like a meter, right? There's like a divisible quantity of it. Uh, so gold is that property simply by the fact that we can, you know, smelt it down and put it into coins and there's a fixed weight of it. So we know like how much pure gold weighs and how much should be, you know, how much quantity there is of it. Um, so the medium of exchange means that it has to be able to be used in exchange for like goods and services. Um, so that goes to the nature that it's like transportable, that you can actually carry like a purse of coinage around with you and that's actually like easy to move around. You know, it's, you know, it doesn't melt in your pocket, you know, like it can be recognized by other people um, in exchange for goods and services. Um, so that's what it's exchanged for. And then the store of value means that um, like on long time scales, uh, its value doesn't fluctuate drastically. Um, so when you deposit gold with somebody, you know that the gold that you can kind of get back is basically worth the same thing when you put back into it. And so if you look at any kind of econ textbook, those are the kind of three properties of monies. So you can come up with like easy counter examples for things that would not satisfy those criteria. And like just for like devil's advocate, if you say like, you know, let's say hamsters are money. Well, they don't satisfy those three properties because like, you know, you can breed hamsters and they can, you know, produce more of them. They're easy to counterfeit. Uh, to transport a hamster around, you can't store it in your pocket, right? Because you have to have, have to like uh, you know, feed the thing. So there's like a maintenance cost associated with that. Um, and, you know, hamsters breed. So it's really like a rubbish uh, unit of account. So like a hamster is a good example of a counter example of something that can't function as money. But gold, you know, it couldn't function as a primitive form of money. Right. Okay. And so to, to come back, um, so gold, you know, e even advanced economies have begun in the past, they'd stockpiled gold in government reserves. They use that to back their paper currency. We kind of come to this, which obviously people have also for very long times issued, uh, certainly for centuries, issued 
kind of paper currencies or fiat currencies, currencies which had a value because someone sort of said they they did. They were they were issued by uh, the the state or by some other entity. And you said gold theoretically acts as this kind of universal numeraire across economic systems. It allows interchange commerce. It's this fixed measuring stick. Um, so as you said, it can function as a, uh, it can theoretically function as a unit of account. So what maybe this is the point to kind of come to what the economic schools and particularly this is one thing to say that economic gold is is one potential option for money and one that clearly in previous times and we didn't have very complex systems of 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 well, of states, of governments, of trust, of, of, for example, to do, to have paper money, to have bills of account, to have ways that we can invent credit and, and, and monitor it and so on. We can understand why gold existed, but there's an actual school of thought that almost says that the metal is school, that, it, that, well, gold or other precious metals should be the only form of money. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, fiat money is actually kind of a fairly recent invention. Um, and the fact that, um, you know, you used to be able to redeem like gold at the treasury meant that it kind of served as kind of a universal numeraire. Like you could take your, your notes for the pound sterling here in England to the Bank of England and get a bar of gold and go to France and then redeem that bar of gold for like, you know, the Franks or something, right? And this would allow international exchange because people were able to, you know, exchange the kind of universal value of gold, right? That allowed international travel, international commerce, um, because everybody kind of universally recognized this as kind of a sort of a store of value for, for all human activity. Um, and so, you know, that worked very well for periods of history when humans mostly traded in like physical goods. So back in, you know, the Middle Ages and like the early 1800s, you know, most uh, transactions were actually for like physical things. Um, they were for, you know, <laughs> for livestock, you know, for, for, uh, for property, um, for um, services, right? But equally these days, um, you know, the things that we're buying and the financial products that we're issuing are, you know, quite complicated products. Um, and so they often exist kind of purely digitally or they correspond to very abstract notions of like value, like financial products or like loans or debt instruments, right? Um, and so the, the metalist position says that, um, you know, gold can still function as those things because it still provides kind of a universal and unchanging sort of yardstick uh, by which to kind of measure value for human activity. Um, and that that can kind of function you know, irrespective of what we're buying or selling, that this kind of universal yardstick, this universal metric can still exist. Yeah. And that that should be the kind of basis for things like the dollar. Um, and that's a school that's a, a school of thought that kind of falls out of the like Austrian school of economics, um, which is a perspective that has a very um, hard line sort of non-interventionist policy about both the monetary supply um, and the economy itself. The Austrians generally believe that any kind of government intervention um, in either the monetary supply or um, in the broader economy um, is an unnatural thing that kind of disrupts the kind of natural sort of business cycles of kind of boom and bust. And then those are actually desirable properties or kind of the market finding equilibrium via price discovery of certain aspects of the economy. Um, and so the Austrians really believe that, you know, we should just let the market forces um, completely dictate these things. And that by setting up something like universal, like the gold standard, uh, there's no actual mechanism by which um, if a dollar is backed by a fixed amount of gold, you can't print more gold, right? Because it's only a fixed supply of it on earth. Um, and so it sort of um, sets itself up to be um, resistant to intervention by design. Um, and they see that as a particularly desirable property. Um, and that's the fundamental basis of the, the Austrian school. Yeah. And so just to say for maybe this, so the Austrian school flourished when we say it in the early 20th century, like von Mies, um, 
Hayek, uh, who Friedrich Hayek, who obviously even got the Nobel Prize for Economics. And I think you've also identified, and it's still, there's still, it's not at all mainstream macroeconomics, but it still has some influence. I think the other point that you mentioned is the connection between that and a kind of political or social philosophy. So what's kind of interesting at this point is that things about money, um, which are obviously related to core functions of the state, the finances, but there's a very strong connection in, in that Austrian economic school um, between kind of what we even call a libertarianism or a very minimal, minimal state, minimal state intervention in the economy and the gold standard, because the gold standard in it, 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 sorry, intervening in the money supply is one of the major ways a state can intervene in the economy. So there might be other things that you don't want to do. You don't want other state planning. You don't want state ownership of enterprises. You might not want um, state managed social, uh, you know, social security. There might be many other things in those positions, but a totemic one would be the gold standard because gold sort of out of the control of, of the state. Um, and I think the other thing that's fascinating, just to put out one third point, which is how that relates to the dynamics of, well, I wouldn't even necessarily say capitalism because I think it goes back before capitalism, but sort of boom and bust and business cycles, because that's been one of the key areas where the credit system, uh, i.e. people uh, creating credit, creating loans and then contracting them. And there's been obviously very lengthy debates about some of the major economic uh, dislocations in our history, uh, the 1929 crash and the Great Depression, um, obviously 2008 and nine. And it's not, it's kind of, it's not coincidental that many of these debates about the monetary policy arise these times of business crisis, a uh, business cycle crises, as it were. Um, it's not that the fact that Bitcoin ultimately arose and sort of took off around 2008, 2009, um, and that many of the debates over the previous gold standard happened in the 1930s. So just the three things to recap there, it's the, this school, which is a, this kind of school in economics, sort of minority, not heterodox, you might say, not mainstream. And second, that it's a strong connection with libertarianism or what we could traditional laissez-faire liberalism. And uh, finally, this relationship with the business cycle and uh, credit boom and bust and credit cycles. And, but I, and I want to emphasize that. I think that that's a key. One last insight I want to draw out, all of those, is that it goes to very root intuitions. Many of these discussions, even around the gold standard, go to very fundamental things that often go well beyond economics about just how we should sort of organize society. You know, is there a natural way society would be without the invention state? Are there things that are natural or unnatural? Are there, is it, you know, should people be helped out when they've been foolish and taken on too much debt? Just like, should we help countries that have taken on too much debt? Um, and it's also an area where what can seem intuitions at a personal level, famously, as Keynes said, can turn out to be fallacies at a group, a collective level. So it's an area where there's a rich set of kind of human intuition that may not be always accurate. So maybe you want to come here to say a little bit about fiat money in contrast to I said what the gold standard would be, what gold backed money would be. Um, what's fiat money in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right about the Austrian school. Um, it's, it's definitely tied into some ideas about just trying to deduce like um, things about human behavior itself from first principles, so, like not by data, but by pure like deductive reasoning, we can kind of come up with like the ideals, like the form of an economy, right? Um, it's a school thought called like praxeology. So it's, like, it's much different than the kind of what I would call like sort of mainline school of economics. I try to, well, believe in sort of more interventionist policies and uh, that uh, we can look at data and historical trends and make deductions. So Austrianism is sort of completely set up kind of outside of the, the kind of frame of reason so it's kind of un, it's not a falsifiable claim it makes a lot of like philosophical claims and you're exactly right that touches on a lot of things that kind of get into more political and philosophical issues because uh, um, they're concerning themselves with the, the nature of human existence and like ethics um, but to go back to your question about fiat money fiat money is kind of a fairly recent invention where um, you know instead of having like some sort of hard commodity that backs the uh, the dollar, the sterling, um, it's backed by 
Well, nothing. Um, it's backed by the utility of the currency uh, on a kind of circular basis, like the currency exists to be a currency. Um, so it's basically something that's synthetically created by a government to fulfill the three criterion, right? Um, and instead of there being a fixed supply of it, like there is like for some commodity like gold, there's a variable supply, um, which means that the government can um, expand or contract the money supply. Um, and if you remember from sort of you know econ 101, if you have like a, a demand for a currency, which is you know, consistently throughout history has been kind of a variable thing, like as a function of like, you know, wars and boom and bust cycles and recessions and geopolitical events, right? The demand for a currency is always going to fluctuate. So, you know, if you have a central issuer of the currency that can also um, control the supply, then, you know, you can do something very, very interesting, which is basically try to have price stability on the fiat currency. Which means that um, its value is going to, you know, synthetically remain stable for a large period of time, and this is the kind of um, you know, reason that central banks and their policies exist to basically give rise to price stability on the fiat currency, so that you can do things like, you know, write loans that span decades, right? Because if you know that there's going to be a kind of, you know, reasonable amount of either inflation or deflation within a very small band over long periods of time, then you can loan out money. Uh, to individuals who can do like productive enterprise um, and build things and like, you know, use the future value of money today, right? And that can spur economic growth and gives rise to the whole basis of the economy. Uh, and so in the last, uh, you know, since 1970, uh, the U.S. dollar has been a pure fiat system. It's controlled by the Federal Reserve. Um, they expand and contract the supply of fiat money and they do like inflation targeting to basically try to get the inflation to be about 2%, which means this value kind of slowly goes down over time, um, which is considered generally a good thing um, in a lot of sort of mainstream economics, uh, because when you have an inflationary currency, uh, it incentivizes people not to hoard it, which means that they can go off and basically they're incentivized to go off and like invest it in productive things like companies or going to buy real estate or just, you know, spending it in the economy. Versus when you have a kind of a deflationary currency, um, there's an economic incentive basically just to hoard it. And so the big kind of dichotomy I see between these kind of hard currencies, the sound money as the Austrians call them, that are backed by commodities is that they're inherently deflationary by design um, versus um, the goal of most fiat currencies is often inflationary. Yeah, just to explain that to Lisa, I hope it's obvious, but essentially, like, there's, um, there's this weird behavior. So once we have money, if when we say deflationary, what that means, if we have a fixed amount of gold, but let's say in our economy, let's say we have gold, and we, which is kind of just on money, and we've got cows, which is our productive good. If we get more cows, but there's only a fixed amount of gold, then obviously, the, the value of gold relative to cows has to go up. Our, our currency is sort of appreciating. So if we had 10 cows to start with in 10 gold bars, each cow is one gold bar, but now we have a hundred cows, obviously each gold bar is now 10 cows. Now the issue with that is if you can store money, which you can because you want to have a store of value, you now have an incentive to sort of hoard money because it's sort of, a, it's appreciating in value over time. Um, and at least in the short term, this can lead to, when you have deflation, this leads to people to cut spending. Um, and one of the things that macroeconomics sort of discovered, particularly with Keynes, but before that was that as deflationary can lead to these deflationary spirals, it's what actually happened in the Great Depression in the 1930s with catastrophic consequences globally. And obviously the rise of Nazism and all, you know, had a really big impact was you can get into a deflationary spiral where people are cutting spending people then cut spending more, the value of, you know, they, they're hoarding more money. And we kind of go the opposite way of at least a mild inflation, which mild inflation kind of encourages some degree of, of, of spending and so on. Um, so, yes, I think, so I just want to, we just want to really emphasize that, that def, if you go and look in general, deflation, certainly deflationary spirals are, can be considered big problems. Um, it's also true that massive, obviously massive inflation can also be a, a, a mass, a huge problem as well. Um, but I just want to come back because we're going to, is that, so the thing is that one of the motivations, and it's a justified one, it's where these kind of grains of truth is that fiat currencies have gone wrong in obviously repeatedly bad ways. Once you control a money supply, 
you potentially have the option to sort of behave badly, you know, to print lots of money uh, for whatever reasons, devalue people's existing claims on the money, whether that's still sitting in a bank account or it's overseas people who've bought your bonds. That's one of the things to kind of emphasize and one of the arguments for quote unquote sound money versus Alan Sun money, that there have been major periods when fiat money has sort of gone to zero in history for certain in certain places, Germany and in the great, uh, in the hyperinflation in the 1920s, for example, and many countries during this century, actually. So just to talk a bit more, the Austrians assert here that, that you want sound money, that government intervention in business cycles in general or in the economy is unnatural because free market forces will naturally collect supply and demand um, and that recessions are mainly as both desirable and natural events. And the hard money perspective is that any intervention in the supply dynamics of currencies inevitably leads to inflation, which is harmful to the free market and commerce. Do you want to say a bit more about that, like dis the concerns about inflation, just so we really steel man this position, which is what is the problem with inflation in general? Yeah, your analysis is exactly right. There's been a lot of catastrophic events throughout history where fiat currencies have gone very badly, where like the central issuer of the of the currency got either the supply or the demand wrong, and then the thing either goes into a deflationary spiral or an inflationary spiral. So it's a very subtle balance. And at least here in the West, we've been kind of through like a period of kind of a long peace where that mostly hasn't happened. Uh, but in other countries, it definitely hasn't. Definitely run the World War in the 1930s as well. Um, but to go back to your question, um, the, the Milton Friedman perspective, which is called like the monetarist perspective, is that um, inflation uh, is purely a monetary phenomenon, that rather than there being any kind of like um, broader like economic supply phenomenon that gives rise to inflation, um, that is purely a function of the central bank printing more money that gives rise to inflation. So any increase in the supply ultimately corresponds to inflation. Um, and this is a very hard line sort of um, debated school thought on monetary policy, but it is a school of thought that exists. Um, and the reason that inflation is necessarily bad, especially when it's in large quantities like we're seeing you know, somewhat of it right now is that um, ultimately uh, people's savings uh, if it sits in the bank, ultimately get devalued over time. And if the inflation is a large amount, then people that are, um, you know, exchanging their labor for wages ultimately see the value of their labor go down. Um, versus people that um, are holding assets um, are generally, uh, you know, any kind of asset is kind of a hedge against inflation at that point, right? Because anything that's not dollars, um, and so this kind of perversely incentivizes. Um, people to like not work as hard because the monetary policy doesn't incentivize to do them. So like large amounts of inflation are bad, but in the Austrian school, they see I mean, any kind of inflation um, as being kind of inherently pathological um, and that, that's a hard line position. Yeah, and I think this is something to kind of emphasize again in these points, it's almost like a kind of technical economic discussion, okay? Which if we point out crudely, which is, um, if, yeah, in the sound money position, it's like, oh, well, maybe some management of the currency could be good, but it often goes wrong, so let's not do it. That would be the mild, almost managerial. But there's a deeper connection to a kind of ideological and, and an understandable philosophical position, which is, you know, famously almost Hayek, the road to serfdom, sent any kind of intervention in markets turns, it kind of, it turns economic influence into political power and financial rewards based on non-public information this sort of corrupts at a fundamental level once we start in the state or any other entry the central bank people intervening in the market including especially the market for kind of money we're, we're on not only on the road to kind of mismanagement but to almost corruption at a somehow corruption of ourselves the corruption of our policy um we're on the road to surf to, to a kind of authoritarianism to a kind of enslavement um whether it's enslavement by bureaucracy or by uh authoritarian political movement so there's this quite a deep intuition that money should be in the hands of the free market, not the state, that this isn't just one step on the road to, uh, you know, poor outcomes, but real kind of the road to ruin. Um, is that that's what I think is perhaps also fascinating here is that um, there's this kind of almost two distinct arguments that relate. One is just it's kind of it's not going to work 
you know, we'll, we'll end up, you know, having too much inflation. You know, the, the, we can't manage that thing. We should just let natural law. And the other is that it's also going to corrupt us as we get into, as we intervene, uh, corrupt our state, corrupt our institutions. Yeah, this is where the Austrian school has it like kind of deep resonance with kind of libertarian thought, like the government that governs best governs least, right? And they fundamentally think that like the government really doesn't have any kind of controls to kind of you know, exert influence over the economy. And there is some truth to the notion that if you can, you know, uh, you know, if centralized bodies do have control over the monetary, monetary supply, that does fundamentally give them some power and some non-public information by which they can exert, you know, their influence over markets and over society in general. Um, so the counter argument would be that those controls are probably often vested in sort of democratically elected officials and other, um, you know, in our, in our societies today. Uh, but if you're a libertarian, then, you know, fundamentally that's just always going to be a bad idea uh, because, you know, they're ultimately just going to be the same kind of corrupting you know, government agencies that uh, libertarians don't really feel like has a place. Um, and, you know, Hayek's observations about these things, um, you know, basically stem from that tradition um, where fundamentally he feels that like any kind of, you know, government intervention or centralized intervention is not all that distinct from like the centrally planned economies of like the USSR uh, that's trying to, you know, control these boom and bust cycles and this kind of Keynesian intervention. Um, is really no different than the same kind of, you know, policies that, you know, you to have these like five-year plans um, and that ultimately it's a futile effort um, versus if you have a sort of more interventionist policy, then you think that this is not a futile effort that you can actually affect sort of and stabilize our markets. So let's, let's kind of bring that part. So with part one, the gold standard, um, the, the, to, to, uh, to steel man it in the best part, so it's basically either claim one uh when you have fiat when you have thing which isn't gold standard like or based on uh, gold either you end up with mismanagement you end up with inefficiencies you, you you don't allow the natural operation of the market either it could lead to wild inflation or even just like you don't have the cleaning out you don't have the natural you know in the bust the inefficient firms go bankrupt in you know the boom there's lots of investment or whatever trying to manage that actually makes things worse and then there's the more extreme, and I think the sometimes more potent story, which is that intervention, that, that it's kind of um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and small steps, that once we start intervening, once the state uh, starts intervening in these kind of fundamental aspects of markets, this is, on a, the, this is the beginning of a path to kind of authoritarianism, to centralization, um, to a kind of political, you know, to, yeah, to take away of people's freedom in a profound way. So that's part one. So part two about Bitcoin is once you agree, if you agree with those points, you would love a digital gold because gold has certain uh, disadvantages. So let's come to then Bitcoin, um, the neo-metalist perspective, which is, do you want to explain that to us? So this is a philosophy that's actually fairly new. Um, you know, it only goes back to like you know, 2008, where the notion is that, and this is advanced by a book that's kind of like the canonical text within the Bitcoin world. It's called the Bit, you know, the Bitcoin Standard, uh, which largely proceeds from sort of an assumption of the Austrian school, uh, and then says, you know, historically we've looked at gold as being you know the canonical sound money for the reasons we mentioned before, but now we have this new thing. It's called Bitcoin. And if you just happen to look at it, it seems to have been inspired or accidentally has the same properties that a lot of you know Bitcoin has. It has a fixed supply over time. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin, just like there's a finite amount of you know gold that's going to exist on the Earth's surface. Um, so, so coincidentally, you know this also could have the properties of sound money uh, under the Austrian school. And now Bitcoin um, is actually a significantly better gold. Uh, because instead of having the kind of storage cost of actually physically, you know, moving gold bars around between the central banks and treasuries, like we can actually digitally transmit bits now. Um, and then they claim that the properties about uh, Bitcoin um, satisfy the kind of monetary this one, the account, the medium exchange, and the store of value. Um, and that's while historically we've used gold, now we should use Bitcoin because it's strictly better gold. And this is a very, very popular. 
uh, narrative around Bitcoin that it's not necessarily a payment system anymore, but now it's kind of like um, a store of value, much in the way that kind of gold exists in the economy today. Yes, and then and the next so so what, so what you want is we want the well, so the Bitcoin standard is like the gold standard. We have something that acts like gold as a store of value, uh, at least. There's this fixed supply, which was built into Bitcoin. And this, it's something to emphasize is that, right, it's a, the Bitcoin was directly influenced by these kind of monetarist, metalist ideas. Yeah, if you go on the Bitcoin talk forums where like Satoshi talks, and there's all this discussion about Mises and Rothbard and all of the kind of, you know, early 20th century ideas around monetarist policy, because, you know, the cypherpunk movement, that it emerged out of had a lot of sympathetic resonance with a kind of you know libertarian thought. You know, it's about you know, how can we use cryptography to kind of dismantle the state. And so you see these kind of ideas baked into the notion of Bitcoin, where it fundamentally sees like this is one of those like jokes in software where like uh, you know it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, so if you happen to be in sort of the Keynesian school, you think that the variable supply of you know fiat money is actually a feature. Versus if you're in the Austrian school, you view that as a bug, right? And Bitcoin, you know, funnily has a fixed supply. Uh, and so they see this as like, you know, this is the ideal form of money now. Um, and that's, that's the argument that they, they make from this. That it, it's the new gold. And to, put it, and to put it even more positively, it's still around, it was also, it was like kind of Bitcoin, the allocation of Bitcoin was kind of somewhat fair. Like anyone could go mine it at the beginning. It wasn't like the creators. The creators could have said, let's take all of the 21 million for ourselves and kind of gradually issue them out. I mean, there might have been uh, problems with getting the system started. But essentially, there's this kind of fair distribution at the beginning. At least anyone could go mine. Uh, it rewarded early developers and speculators. And at least before the crypto bubble and then the Cranbrain explosion of all the different coins. And the, to go a bit further with the digital gold thesis, there is a point that Bitcoin sort of needs to be unique, right? It, is that is that correct? I mean, just like the universe has only gifted us like 118, you know, elements, right? You need this to be a kind of singularly unique thing in the landscape of crypto. And the thing about digital assets is that there's you know, potentially an infinite number of them that could exist because they're just computer code. Um, and so Bitcoin's story, its narrative as this kind of like, you know, immaculate conception created by this kind of, you know, anonymous figure gives it a very unique point in the ecosystem where it is the only one where basically, you know, there's no pre-allocation of the currency to anybody really. I mean, Satoshi has some coins, but he's probably dead now. Um, which means that basically, you know, there's a arguably as fair as possible distribution mechanism that basically, you know, gives you Bitcoin based on how early you kind of perceive the value of the project. Um, and that arguably is a lot more fair than a lot of these other kind of distributions of coins where they, they go out to a bunch of people that, you know, sell the coins off to a bunch of venture capitalists in a pre-sale or they have a corporate entity that allocates them to employees, right? Bitcoin doesn't have any of that. It's basically a pure decentralized cypherpunk project uh, that builds on the Austrian tradition. And that's why it has resonance because it is probably the only project that has ever done that. And to add to that, you know, let us say again for Bitcoin now, you know, old in terms of this space, it's proved itself resilient against attacks by malicious actors, market shocks, nation states. Uh, it seemed potentially uniquely suited to replace gold in the future because it has similar properties without the storage costs. It, 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 you know, it, it has kind of made it uh, this far now almost, you know, in theory, half a trillion or a trillion dollars uh, it kind of in, in notional value. And, you know, to finish, Bitcoin is this, uh, I think it's something you were saying to me just before the call, it's like this singular, almost religious act of creation that can never be repeated. It's the first kind of apolitical money. Um, if this worked, if it really was this, Bitcoin standard, if it were the gold standard of the future, we can never do it again. It's the, it's the first and the original and the unique one. And it's apolitical money whose existence is contingent on the universality of mathematics rather than the political winds and circumstances of, of humans. So that's, I think, to recap, if I can, our, the, the steel man thesis, gold standards are good sound kind of quote unquote sound money gold metal backed gold standards 
are, are good because they either just a better way to manage the economy, um, they avoid inflation, or more fundamentally, when you deviate from that, when you allow people to start having fiat money intervening in the economy, that is the, the road to kind of ruin in terms of freedom, in terms of really p- profound things for the way that our polit- societies operate. And if you want a gold standard, but you want a modern one, you want a digital one backed by the new, by not by the laws of physics uh, as is gold, but by the laws of mathematics in the form of cryptography. Uh, And I think we can hear also the resonance with certain kind of ideological narratives and traditions within our society today. Um, Just as it used to be that magicians sought to make gold, now our newfound magicians, our cryptographers and technologists have made a a new gold. And so the second point is that Bitcoin, the second claim is Bitcoin can be that, that gold. So one, we want a gold standard. Two, Bitcoin is it. So let's look at those. If we come to kind of like the analysis, the evaluation, we can start with those two points. So what's the, what's the problem with the gold standard? What's the kind of classic yeah, objection to gold standards as an approach to monetary, monetary policy? Yeah, so... The best article I've actually written on this subject was actually written by the, the last Fed chairman, Ben Bernanke, um, who was actually kind of a hardline Republican, but he wrote a very kind of long article about the, the deep problems historically with the gold standard. I think the kind of most apt metaphor about the gold standard and kind of fixed supply monetary policy is that it's mostly like a game of monopoly. Um, like, you know, you go around trying to collect, you know, property and then to be able to get resources from other players. Right, but a game of monopoly only ends in one way, which is consolidation. Right, so if you have a deflationary asset, um, like like a sound money would be, right, you're incentivized to basically just hoard it because it's going to go up in the future uh, because there's a fixed supply of it. Right, um, and so historically, that's what we've seen when we've been on gold standards in the past. Um, we saw this as recently as back in the 1930s when the United States was on the gold standard and we saw levels of wealth disparity that were kind of unrivaled throughout American history. But if we go back to like the Middle Ages, like deflationary gold back assets like literally were entangled with serfdom where we had like a full on like aristocracy class that basically just hoarded resources and like the disparity was like, you know, most people lived in a complete Hobbesian pit. My life was nasty, brutish, and short. And so while there might be some problems with fiat currency, you know, at least we don't have these kind of enormously socially corrosive deflationary cycles and kind of wealth disparity that we've seen back in history, right? Uh, so like, like what Winston Churchill said, like fiat money is actually kind of like uh, the worst form of currency, except for all the others that have been tried. Um, and so, you know, the gold standard also is just a very brittle, it doesn't have a variable supply, right? Um, so that doesn't allow you to do um, sort of market interventions in times of progress. So if there's like a pandemic, um, instead of being able to kind of, you know, have price stability in the dollar, you're subject to the whims of whatever the economy is going to do. Um, and you can't, you know, inject money into the economy, you can't control the supply of it. Um, and so it's a very inflexible system that basically ties the hands of the central bank to not be able to do anything. Um, and in the Keynesian school, this is kind of, um, you know, this is antithetical to what's going on over there, to what the, how they view the kind of management of the economy. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's completely deflationary means that, you know, you can't do the things that make our economy run uh, because you don't know the predictable value of, you don't have like price stability of, of, the currency over time, uh, because there is a variable demand. Um, and if you have a fixed supply, um, you're going to see exactly what happens to cryptocurrencies, like because prices, you know, from Econ 101, it's the equilibrium found between supply and demand on the currency. And so like it's going to oscillate up and down and have this kind of hyper volatility, which means you can't do things like write loans and mortgages for people. Um, and our entire economy is based on things like uh, credits and mortgages is kind of the basis for most people's standard of living. I think we need to, and to emphasize that even in times which theoretically had a gold standard, like in theory, some parts of the 19th century, once you start having credit, unless you have a very restrictive control of the issuance of credit, 
ultimately you're sort of got a quasi gold standard. You might be gold backed for your kind of notes, the, the notes actually issued by the central bank, but normally you're generating money supply elsewhere. So just to emphasize also in history, people might be saying, but look, we had a gold standard in the 19th century and it wasn't terrible. Often these are periods when actually we didn't have stri a strict gold standard. We had a kind of quasi gold standard because there was a lot of credit issuance going on that was outside of the pure gold backed system that often ameliorated a lot of those problems that we would otherwise have had in a period of significant economic growth with a fixed money supply. And to finish, obviously, William Jennings Bryan, who people may not remember today, uh, but was the great leader of the progressive movement, one of the great leaders of the press movement in the 90s, you know, is that, you know, he was that American farmers or just poorer people in the United States are being crucified on a cross of gold. This is great. Um, the gold standard was this inflationary impact was having this huge kind of immiseration in his view of a large part of uh, the population. So just to emphasize that, that a really strict gold standard wouldn't have even credit issuance and that no one, you know, no one has done, even if you're not a Keynesian, there's very few people, but that's where you'd be if you were a strict uh, medalist. So just to summarize critique one one is that very few people, there's almost no one outside of a very small school of economists and then libertarians who think that going to a gold standard is a good idea because of the deflation risk, the, the value of being able to manage uh, business cycles. And not just because we want to manage them, but because severe business cycles are extremely politically disruptive. And this seems to take away the ability of the state to, 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 to do that. And the third point is that the long, a lot of our long term capitalist economy, the good parts of it that do allow um, issuing of credit, depend on some degree of price stability that management of the money supply uh, provides. And so That's a really good description yeah. of it, yeah. Yeah. That's I think the other un understated point is that uh, on the gold standard, when you have these business cycles in one region of the world, they tend to correlate with kind of economic shocks across other parts of the world. So like the crash of the 1930s, actually kind of because both the United States and Europe were kind of were so contingent on, on gold supply at the basis of their economies, uh, um, the shocks in the Americas reverberated out through Europe. And we saw periods of economic unrest uh, that were kind of triggered because of the market crash of 1929. Um, and that's a very unique property of, of the gold standard. These, these shocks can kind of reverberate and cause, you know, cycles that are not contained within one geographic region or one economic zone anymore, but to kind of reverberate across the entire world. Uh, and that can be enormously socially coercive. So let's take, take one. So that's point. So of the claims for the gold standard, one was sort of, it, it's a better way to manage money. And we're here, we'd say at least there's a fairly substantial and the majority position is that's not the case. It's not a good way to manage the economy, to manage the money supply. Um, number two would be on this point about freedom. And, and that one seems even more dubious. There have been many states who have intervened in, in their money supply. In fact, for in many ways, 100 years. And it doesn't seem to inevitably lead to serfdom. Hayek's claim written obviously soon after the, the Second World War, kind of influenced by that period, hasn't really boy, been borne out. I mean, maybe some hardline libertarians might say that we are on the road to serfdom. We are, or we're already there. We're in societies where freedom has been uh, fundamentally curtailed in, in, in key ways. And again, there is some grains of truth in that, in what we can see in how state influence has spread through our societies. That's a much, again, a deeper topic we could talk about in this series. But at a basic point, it doesn't seem like the, the fears of neo metalists or at least even the claim for libertarians that control of the money supply there are many other things the state is involved in you know that where their influence is spread through our society that seem more concerning even if even if you're a libertarian than control of the money supply um so that's the second kind of arm of that thesis we're also saying when you look at the evidence for it it doesn't seem very strong or not it doesn't seem very attractive as a thesis to most people when you go and evaluate it that hey once you once you move away from a, a monetary a, you know a, a kind of independent metal based or digital metal based um as it were standard you're on the road to serfdom that's a very poignant description and it kind of gets to the heart of what i consider the kind of um 
kind of Austrian neo-metal schools. They think there's an inherent contradiction at the heart of fiat currency that is ultimately just having a very long kind of time frame to kind of unravel itself as kind of like there's an inherent contradiction that will lead to its own destruction. And this is a falsifiable claim. You know, if the fiat money system does collapse, then that would prove the case. But for the most part, if you look at what happened after most nation states kind of removed themselves from these commodity-based monies, prosperity and almost every single metric of human life across most of these you know, every single index kind of went up over time uh, and economies have had fewer shocks. Um, and the, the kind of joke is that the sort of the libertarians have predicted a thousand of the last two financial crises. Like we've had a few of them, but we've had far less than we've had under the kind of massive devastating shocks we've had in the last century. And so, yeah, there's some externalities to the fiat system. And there's definitely some sort of weaknesses in it, but it seems to be kind of, you know, the least worst thing that we've tried so far throughout human history. Yeah, I think that's a that's also a point that will resonate in this in this series is that it's not a truth. We can't say for sure in a way. Uh, it's not partly because some of the claims also one is like an empirical claim that we seem to have had less shocks, and one is a claim well, it Monday might go wrong i mean obviously if you really dig down dig down with people who are experts with monetary system there's not just the empirical argument there are like kind of um good kind of theoretical arguments why the gold standard is not a good idea and similarly there are reasons why the dem a democratic state you know why hayek is sort of wrong why a democratic state intervening in its economy does not necessarily lead us to the ussr and the gulag there are reasons why for example many states which had many nationalized industries in the 1940s and 50s have privatized them. Whether that's, a, again, a good idea or not, it certainly shows that states can go both ways. So that's point one, and we could spend a lot more time on that, but just for now we're saying, well, that arm of the claim seems dubious, but even let's say it were true, even if we agreed with sound money arguments on a neo-metalist position, does Bitcoin deliver on them? What do we, what can we evaluate there? If we were looking for something that was a new gold, does Bitcoin live up to the, 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 to the, it's billing? Well, so then we have to go back to the kind of, you know, the classic economics textbook definition of money. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll say that it satisfies the kind of unit of account definition. You can kind of subdivide a, a Bitcoin, right? But then you look at the other two and you have some kind of problems with this thing. Um, so the medium of exchange part of it um, is the fact that, uh, Bitcoin as a kind of, you know, uh, a means of, you know, exchanging for goods or services, you know, kind of like the coinage of the past is actually kind of actually inferior to just like gold coinage, uh, because the transaction throughput of the technology, meaning the number of like transactions that you can actually do is simply just unmanageable on the kind of global scale of commerce today. I mean, I think the Bitcoin network can do around like seven transactions a second, which is probably enough to run like a small supermarket, but not a global economy. Um, and as of yet, there's been basically by design, no solution to fix that without changing the parameters of the Bitcoin software itself, which is kind of calcified into a form that you know, investors want it to be in now. So it's unlikely to change. Um, so, you know, it's really difficult to actually even transport it in the same way you would transport gold bars between, you know, um, central banks because the throughput of it is simply so small. Um, and then you have the kind of store of value uh, argument, which is an argument that, um, you know, the variance of the price for it, you know, in terms of goods or services, um, it seems to be highly variable um, just due to the kind of fixed supply dynamics of it. Um, so gold has a long kind of historical precedent um, as being kind of a place to park money in times of economic insecurity because its price movements tend to be kind of uncorrelated with the broader market. So there's always been a demand for gold throughout history. And so people kind of park it when the stock market's going tipsy-turvy. With gold probably kind of more or less kind of like staying flat in a period of time versus in times where the market's going up, Gold may have more volatility. So there tends to be sometimes, and it's not always true with our history, but in certain regimes, it has been true. And, you know, gold has this um, synthetic floor on its price that's also induced by its pure use case, right? Because half of all gold is actually used in things like semiconductor fabrication 
and like get, uh, for jewelry. And only about half of it actually goes to kind of monetary and speculative uses. Um, so the fact that gold actually is has a physicality to it, that it is a commodity, um, actually gives it kind of more of a kind of resilience. And if you just look at the pure statistical market data, if Bitcoin were to behave as a store of value, it would have to abandon this kind of hyper volatility. Um, and there's basically no economic mechanism I see for that to actually happen. Um, and if you look at its kind of correlation with gold, it doesn't behave well, like you, gold at all. Can you say a bit more about why there's no mechanism for that to happen? Because what it would have to be is it would stabilize relative to the dollar like it would be like gold it might go up and down relative to gold to some extent but it wouldn't like double or go up 10 times and then go down by half is what you're saying it would, it would have to be a lot more stable and why there's no mechanism for that to happen well because it's kind of a pseudo commodity uh and this is why unlike a traditional commodity where the demand of it should go down when the price goes up um bitcoin has the opposite property of a commodity where actually the demand for it goes up as the price goes up, which is something you pretty much only see with kind of speculative bubbles. Uh, and it's quite clear that Bitcoin is probably kind of a speculative bubble rather than a commodity because it doesn't have this kind of synthetic demand from the price floor for its use case because it, it doesn't is a have an actual demand outside of just being, being yeah. Speculative, yeah. So I don't see any economic mechanism by which it could stabilize because there's no central issuer to kind of control the supply of it. And there's no price floor from its use as a commodity. So it looks like a purely kind of speculative tulip beanie baby kind of like thing uh, from its price behavior. And that's what we see reflected in the statistics and the data. If you look at price of Bitcoin and its variance and the price of gold, they don't match. They don't have the same kind of function as a financial product as each other. So it's not a store of value um, and it doesn't seem to be a mechanism by which it could become one. So instead it's a product that people buy purely for price appreciation which is not a store of value. So that contradicts the kind of third property of money. And so that's right. kind of fun contradiction I see in there. So this, just to summarize that, there are three things we wanted for something to be, even if you wanted a digital gold, for it to be a digital gold, it has to, unit of count, uh, sure, we can divide or subdivide Bitcoin. It's not, but it's not usable as a medium of change, which is the number two requirement. It, transactions in Bitcoin are very expensive, they're slow, they're, there are other issues we could go into about them at the moment. Um, in general, I mean, there are always these debates, it can be made better and so on, but in general, it doesn't seem to be, right now, certainly does not seem to be used in that way. People are not using Bitcoin as a day-to-day -day medium of exchange very much. Number two, and maybe more crucially, because this is the focus right now, is Bitcoin is a store of value. It's like the gold bars I can put in a vault. And for that, to summarize your argument, you want it to be relatively stable. And um, there won't, you know, and, and that just doesn't seem to be happening at all. Uh, in, in anything, Bitcoin looks like a speculative bubble, which will at some point therefore crash. Um, now, that's again, it's a partly an empirical test. It's one of those slightly unfalsifiable ones from the other point of view, because you could just say, we haven't been around long enough. Even if Bitcoin went to zero, people could say, it could go back up again. It's one of those tough ones, but as a general assessment of its store of value, it isn't delivering on that. And I know that Nassim Taleb, uh, the author of The Black Swan, wrote a long article on that point, um, uh, and other people have about the store of value point. So it doesn't seem to be uh, that one. Then there's another point, which I think just to finish on is, in theory, it should be unique. That's one of the claims of the neo-metalist position. There'll be one, there'll be one digital gold, um, because otherwise, Ironically, we actually have inflation. If we can have lots of different uh, coins, we kind of have an inflationary ecosystem in which I can print new money or my hamsters reproduce, uh, which we have actually seen. We've seen all of these new coins get created, but that's actually a problem for it as a store of value because my risk is of all of the hundred different coins that could be out there, which one of them will actually keep its value, which one will not. So just to talk on that uniqueness point, there was a claim like in the Bitcoin standard, it will be unique. And there is some aspect where it is the biggest by far of the generally the alternative, you know, the crypto coins. But what, what do you have any thoughts there on its kind of uniqueness claim for Bitcoin? Well, it's not particularly unique in the fact that there's like, you know, half a dozen forks of the Bitcoin, uh, you know, mainline itself, right? So what makes it particularly strange is this kind of notion of like forking. 
where like suddenly you have like a commodity and suddenly there's like two of the commodity, which is not something that actually happens with physical objects in our universe, right? Where it's suddenly like you have a cow, now suddenly there's two cows with two histories and they're basically, they come from the same place. So that's a very strange thing that doesn't actually exist in like physical commodities like gold bricks, right? But the fact that also is like, you know, there's Litecoin, there's Dogecoin, you know, there's half a dozen other of these, you know, coins that are basically based on the Bitcoin principle. And like, if we're gonna label one of them as gold, there has to be a kind of you know falsifiable claim about like which one actually is it, which fork of Bitcoin is it, which you know is Dogecoin digital gold? Like because every single argument you could make about why Bitcoin is digital gold, you could also make about Dogecoin, or Litecoin, or any one of these other coins. And there's like last last I looked, there's like twenty thousand different coins out there. So you have this kind of Cambrian explosion of private money, which kind of looks like a lot of what we saw back in the early like 1800s, like with the kind of wildcat banking era. Uh, but it doesn't really link students to the fact that there's a singular, unique value proposition of Bitcoin. And just to go to that, this is a crucial point, which is if you, if we want to be, once we go down that route, once we have multiple private money issuers, we who are not backed by the thing, um, as it, I mean, there are obviously multiple private money issues in the world. There are states. Um, but if I understand right, only states ban the issuing of, or like they they regu highly regulate the issuing of legal tender, or the fact there is only one legal tender, i.e. something you can render to the state in exchange, you know, in payment of your taxes or for other things, or that people must accept in society. Once we go, the history of large kinds of issuance of private money aren't that good, is that right? No, I mean, just for the sole fact that like, you know, if you're in one kind of economic region, um, you don't want to go change your money all the time because it's kind of a pain in the ass to really do. do. You want to go to a store and buy a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk and get quoted in one price, not to have you know 15 different types of private money that you can buy it in. And for you as a shopkeeper, where right, you want to make change for your customers in like one currency and you want to buy your goods in one currency and you want to negotiate your contracts in one currency and pay your, you know, your mortgage in one currency. You don't want this can bring an explosion of these things because just it introduces friction to commerce. And fiat money has this lovely property where you can create synthetic demand for it by the fact that you have to extinguish your obligations to the sovereign, to the state, in the currency that they issue. So this creates this kind of circular flow of money through the economy that makes the whole system work. If you have private issuers of the money, um, you have none of that demand. Uh, and basically, there's no guarantee that the state's actually going to backstop the thing. So the state is not the necessary issue of the currency. It's just the most natural one, just by the very function yes. of what we want to do with money and what it should behave as. Right. Yeah. So, so I think there's just two to summarize those arguments, which is money is a platform, like language is a platform. To some extent, uh, we want we want one or very few. There's huge efficiencies benefits of like having one thing. Like we all speak English, there then we can communicate. Um, and I think this is a cru crucial point. They also bring up like markets are good things in some areas. Markets for corn are a good idea. Markets for money aren't necessarily a good idea. Or markets for ideas don't seem to function in the same way as mar markets for corn sort of seem to work. You know, quality and price they work themselves out. Markets for ideas don't seem to have worked that way. They're, they're much more complicated. They don't operate in, in that same way. And I think there's another point. So one is the issuance of private money. I think the thing you haven't even mentioned, but normally goes very badly wrong. And there's two things, there's a lot of fraud and there's a lot of, um, there's inefficiencies, but there's also fraud and there's a general breakdown in trust. I have to spend a lot more energy working out which bank if, if any bank can issue its own bank notes, which bank is reliable, which bank is not. There are these huge, uh, you know, kind of problems that arise where then you force on to kind of private individuals a lot of informational research. And therefore, when they don't do it, a, a reduction in trust. And I think this brings me, I want to kind of highlight this because I think this is what is what one theme during the series, I think is subtle and fascinating that I want to explore is about the nature of trust and the functioning of societies. Because the irony is, one of the things you just said is private money, if it really worked, would actually eradicate huge amounts of trust. But I think in some of the, the dreams, that's almost a good thing. Instead of trust, we'd have truth. 
somehow we'd have some system for evaluating, you know, I can imagine the, the people who are fans of lots of coins, there'd be some system for evaluating which coins are reliable and we'd all vote on them or we'd do this or that. But it seems to be a system that replaces maybe centrality, but trust in that centrality and governance mechanisms, for making sure that central entity, i.e. our states, but, you know, we have democracies, we have governance, mechanisms, and so on, but with something that doesn't need that trust, but somehow it's going to rely on cryptography, you know, trust less, cryptography more, or trust less, truth more. But I don't think that's a trade that actually works. And if you don't think it's a trade that works, once you destroy trust, it's very hard to get it back. And that seems to be like a huge risk in a lot of this, that you can, you can, you can do, and, and even just something said right now, let's say loads of crypto went terribly, there'd actually be a general reduction in trust, I think in our states, we're like, why hadn't they regulated it? Or it's kind of, a, at the moment, states probably can't win. If they regulate it, they're take, you know, they're, they're taking away the innovation, but if they don't regulate it and things go wrong, why didn't the state do something? But I want to kind of emphasize this point of, there's a really foundational question about where you sit ideologically about the value of trust, versus kind of like non-trusting I'm going to verify with kind of somehow mathematics or facts and I find that fascinating to see within this ecosystem that kind of come up that that litmus test between people you know, that's a profound observation and that goes kind of even deeper than economics because there's kind of two different schools of thought around like where the value of money actually comes from philosophically there's the value that it comes from the credit model in which ultimately you know i do a favor for you and then ultimately you know i'm going to expect a favor and you know from you and i'm going to trust that i'm going to give a favor for you for sort of some sort of work or services versus you have the kind of hard monetarist commodity value that says, well we can't trust each other so we need something to kind of mediate the exchange that we can kind of both agree both exist and the libertarians and the kind of the whole school of thought kind of stems from this kind of deeper humanistic aspect of that you know we want to minimize trust versus the credit model says we want to expand trust. Um, and fundamentally, I happen to kind of fall more on the kind of, you know, society and all of civilization is basically built on, you know, we should learn to trust each other more. And that's an engine for economic progress versus the kind of and social dual perspective, progress. social progress, yeah. The trust is the funda fundamental basis on which civilization is based. And then a lack of trust is actually kind of the, the pathological state of being versus the libertarian theory the other way around and that's a kind of humanistic kind of you know argument about psychology and ethics rather than yeah what i would call i'd even call it i call it i tend to call those ontological or we could call it psychological i mean i tell you like, you know it's a view about the nature of human beings mm -hmm. versus and, and and what i think is really important though is that the nature of human beings is also not fully given it's not just our genetic endowment. We are shaped by the societies, the cultures, and our experiences. And that's why there's actually something, I don't like this, but the real one strong critique is that if we kind of go down this route of we trust less, we actually do trust less. It isn't just that we, what we come to be, what we believe. Um, and there's really strong evidence for this. Um, just to finish on this episode, I mean, there's incredible work by Joseph Henrich, um, this uh, cultural anthropologist, I don't know what you call him, these incredible work over the last 20 or 30 years. For example, just looking at how Western Europeans or what Westerners in general are kind of unusual. One of the ways they're unusual is having very high trust levels. Um, we also have very strong evidence that trust of strangers, especially, is highly correlated with uh, social and economic outcomes uh, in, in, positive, in very positive ways. And that that was cultivated uh, over millennia or centuries in this case, it's not just the given of the human species. And that's where I think you're right. It's a fascinating point that at the root of this is kind of assumptions about the nature of human nature. Um, and particularly how we can shape that. How do we, how do we, for example, scale our collaboration? Do we do it through cryptography? I mean, I don't even think that, but some kind of formal systems and governance systems that we can then enforce through software and rules, or are we going to do it by learning to trust each other? Uh, in, in other ways that come from our culture, perhaps in, supported by, enforced by institutions and norms, but ultimately coming from ourselves. Are we going to scale human collaboration in one way or the other? And the, the tension I think we just identified here is, ironic, their intention 
as, as I create more formal rules in a way, or I, I, I often coming from this assumption that I'm going to trust people less, as you said, the libertarians, it actually undermines the ontological approach. They, uh, they can be complementary, but they can also be intention. I think that's a really uh, brilliant point, Stephen, uh, uh, that you brought there, that we, uh, of what is kind of a, a, a fault line uh, that helps us understand why people of good faith, in a way, people have in this area incredibly different positions. Because I want to end this episode by saying what we're going to, we're really fascinated by is how do we make sense together? This is an area of significant polarization where seemingly intelligent people have radically different positions and views. How can we whether either reach agreement or even understand our differences with clarity? And I hope for our listeners in this episode, we've done that. We've helped explain in at least a crude way the, the basic steel man thesis for Bitcoin as a gold standard, the Bitcoin standard, and why at least uh, and on our evaluation, there'd be a lot of question marks about those claims, but you can go and test that for yourself. And we'll be sharing as part of our material from this podcast, um, a bunch of kind of what we call hypothesis trees or issue trees and background analysis that allow you to walk through and work through for yourself the assumptions and claims and to enrich it, I hope, uh, in various ways. Anything you'd like to say, Stephen, before we end for today? Oh, I fully agree, and I agree that like the crypto phenomenon is this kind of ontological Rorschach test in which you're going to see kind of your own ideology kind of reflected back at you. And the reason I feel that like it's so polarizing is that when you get down to the base, you know, presuppositions in this decision tree around whether you support it or don't support it, you come back to some very real human issues and why there's such an animus about such of these things. Um, is that, you know, you fundamentally get to questions about like, you know, human psychology and trust and like, what is the ideal configuration of society and what are the solutions to the economic problem? And these fundamentally are questions that there are no answers, there's only schools of thought. And if we can understand, you know, if these technologies can kind of coexist with those schools of thought or whether they can't. And I think that's a really important question to answer in this kind of whole discussion and narrative and investigation into the space. Brilliant. Well, just to end, if you want to find out more, check out lifeitself.us slash web3 or follow Stephen on Twitter at twitter.com slash smdeal uh, and you follow can follow me at twitter.com slash Rufus Pollock and we will also be posting links with the show notes. Thank you very much and we look forward to tuning into the next episode. Thank you.